Jenny and this, you guys don't need to come up necessarily. This is just going to be a Pastor Rich added this in during his announcements. So I'm going to go up and read the song. We're going to sing one verse and sweet out of prayer. And then we'll read the prophets from the 10 and 11 every day. So, but you guys don't need to just sing out of prayer. Oh, yeah. Yes, that would be okay. It's good. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that's good. 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 Yeah, Andrew and Jenny are running a little late. And you have a list of these uh, clipped onto the music stand so you can kind of see what's going on.
Well, good morning and welcome to Union Grove Baptist Church. It's great to see a lot of people here with us this morning, as well as I know many are watching on live stream and perhaps listening out on the FM station in the parking lot. Welcome to church today. It's good to see you here. If you're a guest with us, we especially give you a warm welcome. Thanks for joining with us this morning. We're gonna start the service off with a song. Uh, so let's stand together. Uh, the song is titled, He is King. It gives us a praise of the Lord Jesus. He is King, He is Lord, and He is God. We're gonna sing all three verses together. It is number 33 in the hymn book, if you'd like to sing from there. Otherwise, the words are up front here. Let's sing out in praise of the Lord Jesus this morning as we get started. He is King. He is king, he is king, Jesus Christ is king of kings, and his power shall reign forever and ever. He is king, he is king, Jesus Christ is king of kings, and his power shall reign forever Hallelujah, hallelujah, to our king, king of kings, hallelujah, hallelujah, to our Jesus Christ is King of kings, and his power shall reign forevermore. He is Lord, he is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord of lords, and his power shall reign forever and ever. He is Lord, he is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. great to see you and uh, next week is opening Sunday not this week so you're early no good to see you um, <laughs> boo I got a boo on that one good uh, I deserve a boo but it's great to see you folks uh, out here and boy oh boy we've had a, a great weekend we'll share a couple things in just a moment about that but uh, welcome and if uh, I don't know if we had any visitors any visitors today nice and high because we got a gift for you if we do now everybody's hand goes up, right? All right, well, good to see you folks. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Next week is our grand opening, so June 7th. Uh, we're we're going to be get all the folks that haven't been here, call them up, uh, send them a letter, text, whatever it takes. And uh, I think we're going we're gonna to try to pack this place out next Sunday. So uh, I'm glad you're here, though, and we'll look forward to next week when we have our grand reopening. All the major ministries will be back in gear. So if you look in your bulletin, everything's listed. I don't want to uh, take too much time on that. But a couple of, of things that are a little bit new, which is uh, uh, the ladies will be having a get-together on Tuesday the 16th. So that, that's big. Uh, ladies, the sign-up is in the back. We just need to know who's coming. Uh, so if you'd sign up there, that would be great. Summer Quest will be starting. Now, if you're not familiar with that, what that is, it's basically like a, a extended Awana program, but it's not Awana, and uh, that'll be starting up on uh, June 17th, right? First Cassidy, June 17th, right? Okay, good to go. 
So we'll, uh, we'll need some workers for that. So if you're interested, see me or Cassidy will uh, basically be in charge of the program. And uh, we are looking for some helpers. And then we'll, if we don't get enough, I'll be calling you. No, okay. All good. Uh, one thing I did want to bring up is the ministry center, which was formerly the parsonage, is now our ministry center. I think most of you are familiar with it. And uh, we're starting to have dinners. We're, we're inviting a couple couples at a time. Uh, bring you over to have dinner with myself and Valerie so we get to know folks a bit better. So if you haven't been called or scheduled yet, we're already booked for about a month. So uh, we'll be calling you. We're your, we want everybody in the church to get in to, to have dinner with us. If you're visiting, you're also going to be invited. So if you fill out a visitor card, you'll eventually be getting a call as well. So uh, we want everybody to uh, we want to meet folks and engage with you. All right, last night and uh, well, actually yesterday, up through the afternoon and Friday. So Friday noon to Saturday at noon, we had our tent of meeting. So if you drove in and you like, what's the tent doing back there? Well, we had a 24 hour prayer vigil back there and we were praying for our country, our local government elected officials, as well as uh, first responders. And uh, we also heartily prayed for Union Grove Baptist Church, the folks that are here and uh, the evangelistic outreach that we intend to have. So 24 hours of seeking the Lord, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to break protocol here, Josh. I'm going to ask you to come up here and sing one verse. Uh, why don't you, sweet hour of prayer, we're just going to sing one verse, and then I'll finish up here. All right. It is 437 if you want to sing in the hymn book, but one verse, sweet hour of prayer. Let's sing it out together. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer and uh, we're going to make a new song called Sweet 24 Hours of Prayer. And that's exactly what happened. Now we had maybe an hour, hour and a half where somebody wasn't literally in the tent. Uh, but folks, uh, I mean, it, it was a heartfelt prayer time. Uh, we literally prayed. Uh, Justin actually got it started, prayed through the entire directory. So if you're in the directory, you got prayed for. Uh, so it was a great time. So let's look forward to what the Lord's going to do there. All right, I think that's all we're going to do. Uh, but again, thanks for being here. Next week, folks, let's pump it up. We're going to have a dinner uh, after the Sunday school hour, and we'll get into that later. Well, actually, the first vendor I called said, I can't handle that bigger crowd. We're not ready yet. So uh, we're still working on the vendor, but I'm guaranteeing you, uh, and they say if they feed you, you'll come, right? So we're going to feed you. So uh, let's, let's fill the place up next week, and we'll look forward to it. Josh? Uh, let's stand together. We're going to continue to sing the song. The title is, He Will Hold Me, he will hold me Fast when, my, when I Fear My Faith Will Fail. Let's sing it together this morning in worship. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is soft and cold. Hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me.
Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold. Thank you for being here. What a blessing. It's, been, it's just a thrill to see all of you back here. Uh, we're, we're online also, but what a blessing to have the pews filled up. And uh, we're excited about next week. There has been so much work taking place around here. It's, it's been, we've been very busy. It's been exciting seeing everybody working. There's been many working over in the ministry center, painting and putting in a new faucet and just fixing and working on things. Obviously, we've got the carpet out of our out of the overflow. This week there were a number of people helping clean the floors up, uh, getting them prepared for the carpet. Uh, thank you, thank you to those involved that helped clean up after that mess. This place was so dusty, you have no idea. I mean, it was, I didn't know what to do, and there were a few that jumped in and were going to clean this, and uh, thank you very much to those involved there. We had a number of people out helping put the tent up this week. The prayer meeting went so wonderful. It was just a blessing to be there. The fellowship that we had together, seeking the Lord's will, calling on the Lord, just a tremendous blessing. We're, 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 I, if, if you weren't able to be here, we, I, I hope we do this again soon. And uh, what, It was just wonderful to be here and be part of that. We are, uh, we've, there's been some monies coming in towards the air conditioning system that we're going to be installing right outside these windows uh, to condition the gymnasium in the classrooms down in that area. We have a huge humidity problem down in the lower level of this building, down in the classrooms. We've got dehumidifiers running all the time, and this would alleviate a lot of that problem. So if you'd like to be part of that and give towards that uh, the air conditioning uh, installation. We, we need to purchase one more unit. I think we've got just about enough money to pull the trigger and get that over here. Uh, but we've got some concrete to pour, some ducting, some gas lines, electrical lines, and uh, so another project there. We've got many more. Be praying for us. We've got uh, Fourth of July parade coming up. We're going we're gonna to have a float in the parade, Lord willing. And uh, we've got VBS coming up in August. We're we're trying to work some dates out there. We had dates picked out, but we found out there's a family camp up at Camp Fairwood. So I think we're adjusting our dates on uh, our VBS, trying to coordinate with so we can encourage families to get up to Camp Fairwood for family camp. So be praying for us. We thank you so much for being here and being part of the ministry. I'm thrilled and excited what the Lord's doing here. It's just been a tremendous blessing being here. Thank you. Uh, before Pastor Rich comes to bring the word to us, the uh, worship team and some others are going to sing a song for you called Creator God. And it does talk about God's creative 
uh, power and all his other, a lot of his other attributes, but then it asks an important question. It says, but who am I? That you, God, being so great and so awesome, uh, take any mind or any thought of my, my life. Who am I that you would care about me and what I'm going through? And yet we know that he does care and he does know. And so uh, listen closely because this song will be uh, shortly introduced into our uh, congregational worship. So you're going to be singing this pretty soon. So I hope you enjoy it as they sing it to you. so much. Isn't it good to have good music? That was great music. Uh, it sets the tone for things. And uh, so thankful for our musicians. Thank you, sir. All right, take your Bibles, please. Go to the book of James. And we've been going through 
uh, the book of James. We're up to verse 18 now in our verse-by-verse study. And the book of James is extremely practical. And I've been, I picked this series on purpose. I've never preached through this book before, but it's been a, a great time of, of learning uh, the book of James. It was actually after I got saved as a teenager, I memorized the entire book. And uh, still a lot of that is stuck up here, which is good. Um, I saw a few smiles like you're getting old. Maybe it's, it's slipping out, but no, I got it. It's still up there. Um, you ever hear that... Uh, uh, spaghetti sauce commercial it's like where's the meat and they just say it's in there and it's still in there folks so uh, the word of God once you plant it in your hearts how important that is so uh, we'll be looking at the book of James if you want to open up turn to uh, verse 18 I'm going to read three verses and uh, then we'll get started with the message James chapter 1 let's start at verse 18 and we'll just read a couple of verses Ready? Uh, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for uh, the dear people that are here this morning. Father, it's such a joy to see them. Thank you for the wonderful 24 hours of prayer time that we uh, just finished. And Lord, uh, so many wonderful things happened during that 24 hours. Lord, I pray something wonderful would happen here right now. Lord, I pray that uh, every single person here, uh, under the sound of our voice, Lord, that uh, you do something in our hearts, that you'd stir us up, that you'd excite us about the precious Word of God that we'll be studying this morning. And then, Father, for those that are watching now and will be uh, watching at a later time on our live stream and our videos, uh, Father, bless them. Father, uh, uh, move in their hearts. We ask that you'd revive the saved and save the lost in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So again, we're uh, in the book of James, and this morning the key thing, and if you picked up on it in the passage that we read, it truly is centering on things that the Word of God can do in our life. So what we're going to be doing this morning, and again, I like to use this uh, little concept, we're peeling God's Word one passage, one verse at a time, asking God to speak to us and move in our hearts. Now, you can't get away from that concept when you're using the Word of God because God's Word does change our lives. And that's the key point that we're going to be picking up on uh, this morning. So just a a quick uh, review of where we've been. If you want to see these messages, you can go on our website and review them or see them if you've missed them. Uh, But our first message was on basically uh, what we're calling core Christianity. These are the core things we need in order to uh, uh, serve the Lord, I would say, in a proper manner. The single-minded Christian, not double minded, not uh, half in, half out, so to speak, with our, with our Christian values, morals, and, and principles in the Word of God, but single-minded. The key verse was a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. In other words, James says, be single-minded, be focused on God, be focused on His Word, and folks, you can't go wrong if you follow that advice. Then we looked at uh, the wealth of the humble. We took some time a few weeks ago And we examine how important it is to honor all people. Whether they're wealthy, whether they're poor, whether they're humble, whether they have great resources, God actually looked at those who have very humble resources. James, remember, and here's the cultural background when we look at the book of James. He's writing to the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. These were Jewish individuals that had come to Christ. They were going through horrific persecution. They were scattered abroad. They didn't have finances. They were humble. And God said, listen, treat the humble correctly. They're actually exalted was the word in God's eyes. Then last week, we reviewed from our core Christianity, overcoming temptations. Now, folks, if you missed that message, I highly encourage you uh, to go back into our media files and uh, listen to it or watch it on video. Folks, every single one of us struggles with temptations. Everyone. 
Uh, you may, your temptations may be different than mine and so forth. We're all different. We all have different things that uh, uh, try to get a hold of us in the wrong way. But uh, temptations, folks, those are the things we've got to overcome. We looked at, if you see the picture, it's actually talking about being an overcomer, and overcomer being a victor, like an Olympian who had the wreath put around their neck. You overcome uh, temptations. God said, I'll give you a crown of life. And uh, what a wonderful thing that is. We all look forward to it. Now, today, I like these words, radical regeneration, radical. Uh, you say, oh boy, here we go, uh, you're going off onto some deep end? No, I'm going deep into the Word of God about being radically regenerated and serving the Lord Jesus. So how do we get radical regeneration? And I'm not talking about going out and protesting, okay? We've had enough of that in our uh, cities recently. We're not talking about that kind of radical. We're talking about a, a person whose life has been radically changed for Jesus Christ. How does that happen? Well, that's what we're going to be examining this morning. Here's the key question, folks. Do you love God's life-transforming word? Do you love it? I mean, uh, yesterday, and, and I'm, I'm not even in the message yet, but I've watched people and several people, they come in and they were so moved by the times that we were reading scripture, the times we were praying, and uh, I watched the tears flow on multiple people. Why? Because it's so moving, it's so important. God moves in our hearts. Folks, you, you, I, I don't know, and, and sometimes I, I say, Lord, what's going on? And uh, the last week or so, I mean, the Lord, I, I, and it happened to me, I think, uh, Sunday morning last, last week. And all of a sudden, the Lord, I mean, it just so moves me. Uh, I'm a big guy, I, and uh, I don't like crying, but my goodness, the, the God just kind of overcomes, and it's like something is so moving. Uh, they were playing the, the power of the cross this morning, and I almost lost it before, before church. It's like when, God, when you're walking with God, folks, when you're in tune with him, uh, you just can't help it. And boy, the, the Lord overcomes and moves folks. And uh, Lord, you say, uh, is it wrong to cry in church? No, it's right to cry in church sometimes. Uh, if God moves you, say, have you been uh, uh, crying tears of, of pain? No, I've been crying tears of joy when God moves in you and you're just so moved uh, by the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't happen a lot of times, but this last week, I mean, I'm like, Lord, shut it off, please. I'm tired of crying. I'm running out of water. Um, <laughs> but, but it'll happen, and it, it could happen when I'm preaching. But just bear with me. I'll be fine. I'll drink some more water, get some more water, and me, we're good. Well, what are we looking at? So here's a couple of questions for you as we get started. Has your life, did you catch that? Has your life been radically changed by the Word of God? Has it been radically changed? Now, some of you got saved when you were very young. And by the way, I'm going to pause here for a minute. Sunday school starting up next week. Summer Quest will be starting up in a couple of weeks. Majoring on young people up through about grade six. Now, can you do me a favor? I'm going to ask you one public question, and I'm just looking for a hand raise. How many of you, if you would please, were saved by the time you were in sixth grade? Hands up. Look around. Please hold them up. Look around. Look at how many people were saved before they hit or during sixth grade. Thank you so much. God bless you. Do you understand how important Summer Quest is, folks? Do you understand how important Awana is? Do you understand how important Sunday School is? You just visualized. Thank you so much. I mean, you, you, you proved the point. This is the time when hearts are still tender and God's moving in lives, and he changes them. How does he change them? By the word of God. Huh? By the word of God. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Has your life been radically transformed? Now you say, well, I got saved when I was three years old, four years old, five years old. Some folks, uh, my daughter, uh, how old were you when you got saved? We, we can talk. Three? Are you sure? That's pretty young. And folks, she, she got saved when she was three years old. I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with her, and uh, she trusted Christ. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I have many times questioned her over the years about her salvation because I'm like, you know, three years old is awful young to make a decision for Christ. That's very young. 
So I'd push her and I'd push her and I'd say, are you sure you're saved? Are you sure you've trusted Christ? And if you died right now, how do you know you're going to go to heaven? And every single time she said, listen, I, I knew I was a sinner at three years old. She's right. She was. I'm terrible. Anyway, no. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I love her dearly, despite that she's a sinner. Anyway, uh, 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 so she, she trusts Christ. She knew she was a sinner. She knew she'd done wrong. I mean, she didn't have a whole lot of years to mess up, but uh, she managed. And, uh, uh, but, but with all seriousness, and she understood the gospel message that Christ Jesus came down from heaven, died on the cross for sins, and she put her faith and trust at three years old. That's a little unusual, pretty young. Uh, but then, folks, don't ever hear, here's, uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but it's on purpose. If you have children and they said, you know, uh, mom, dad, back in uh, when I was four or five, six years old, I trusted Jesus, I think, in Sunday school or Awana, and I think, I, and I'm saved. You say, well, that's great. And it is great if it's true. Don't ever take for granted that your child truly trusted Christ. You say, what, what do you mean? I want you to encourage them, but... Do you know how many young people, adults, did you catch that? Adults, teenagers, senior citizens make a profession of faith, but they never possessed Christ. So I always encourage my young people, I don't, wanna, I don't want them to doubt that they're saved if they're truly saved, but I don't want them to be convinced they're saved if they're truly not. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you catch it? Uh, uh, what would be the worst tragedy on earth is having Tabitha at three years old say, I got saved, Daddy. And then at six years old, I said, well, you remember back when you were three years old, you trusted Christ and you're saved. That would be so wrong of me. No, here's how I've always treated it. Honey, if you died right now, where would you go? Well, I know I'd go to heaven. How do you know that? And she told me the gospel. And I said, are you sure you trusted Jesus? I absolutely positively know I trusted Jesus. And I watch her life. Her work's evidence that she's trusted Christ. I know it. Uh, uh, but I don't know it. I will never, ever tell anybody, listen, you trusted Christ when you were X years old, and therefore you're saved. No, you're the only one that knows if you truly trusted Christ. Amen? I mean, I don't know that. So if I ever question you, uh, maybe in a counseling session or whatever we might be doing, folks, I want to be sure you're saved. When I... I am really rambling today. I worked in a church. I, I, work is a loose term because it was an unpaid position. We were in college at the time. And we'd go into the inner city of Chicago and we'd pick up hundreds of kids and bring them to Sunday school and church. And I always thought when we were, we'd have a bus packed out with young people. I had a couple of workers and I was always wondering, you know, when, when we bring all these hundreds and hundreds of kids to, to the church that I was at, and if what would happen if that bus had an accident? What would happen if, if the bus overturned and I lost every one of the young people on, on that bus? And I'm like, have we, have, we, have we given the gospel to them? Folks, is there anything more important than the gospel? There is not. Is there anything more important than someone trusting Christ as their personal Savior? There is not. There's nothing more important. So when we're looking at the Word of God today, if I ever get into the message, second point is, does it, does it even make sense that the Word of God can radically change your life? I don't care if you got saved at three years old or 92 years old, God will radically change your life, if you, if you know His Word. I'm going to take you to four passages for the key passages. So if you want to grab your Bibles or take the notes on this, we're going to look at the four key verses that describe exactly uh, what God's Word will do, and then we'll get into the actual passage. But for the note takers, if you went to Bible school or you went to seminary, these four verses are the key verses. Actually, it's five verses and four passages. 2 Timothy 2.15, we've spoken on this before. So here's the verses. They're not on the screen. These are, these are free of charge, okay? 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent. If you have a King James Version, it says study. Be diligent or study to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
So the first verse we have here, 2 Timothy 2.15, it's, it's if, if I'm going to a book signing and, and uh, selling books or whatever, I always put that verse in there, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study, learn the word, know the word. Folks, as Christians, if you've trusted Christ, if you know you're saved and you're not studying the word of God, you're missing out. We're going to talk about that. Study. Move over to uh, chapter 3, verse 16, the second major verse. All scripture, all 66 books of your Bible, 39 old, 27 new, every single word, every single uh, phrase, every single paragraph, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does inspiration mean? It literally means God breathed it out. Every single word in the original manuscripts is God breathed. It's God's word. You want to know what God is thinking? You want to know what God wants us to know? It's right here, folks. And sometimes, folks, it's truly going to hurt. Let's go to the next one. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 4. Again, these are the absolute key verses when it comes to studying God's word and what God's word will do in your heart and in your life. There we go. Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Here we go. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What is God saying here as we... Get ready to pop into James here in a moment. God is saying the word of God is like taking a two-edged sword and it cuts into you and it changes you. Folks, if you're not radically changed, if you've not radically been regenerated, you've not been reading the word of God, you've not been processing the word of God, and you're missing out. When God cuts into us, it might hurt a little bit, but the end results are phenomenal. Having troubles at home? Having trouble with marriage? Having, 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 having trouble with the kids? Having trouble at school? Having trouble at work? Having trouble with your neighbors? Huh. You pick up that two-edged sword and ah, it changes us. You know what? When you read the Word of God, do you know it doesn't change the other person? It changes you? When, 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 that, when, that, when that stinker neighbor of yours or that person that you're having a tough time with, and you're mad at them, and they've been, uh, they're hurting you, and, and you're just beside yourself. And then, folks, get ready, because we're going to read some verses a little, little bit. You know what's going to happen? It's going to change you, not that person. We cannot change the other person. We can win them to Christ, hopefully, tell them the gospel. But, folks, you know how you get along with people? You change. You know how, you know how I, uh, how I can get along with my wife, Valerie? She doesn't need to change. If I'm out of sorts, it's me that needs to change. You get what I'm saying? The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged two sword. Wow, piercing into the division of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, if you go to Bible school, these are verses you better know or you're, going, you're probably not going to get through. <laughs> this is the basic. This is the basic meat of the word when it comes to understanding the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. You ready? Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What's God saying here? 27% of your Bible is prophecy. In other words, when it was written, 27% look forward to future things. 50% of those prophecies, as I've said many times here, have already come to pass. There's a thousand prophecies in Scripture. 500 have come to pass exactly as stated, meaning there's 500 more to be fulfilled. We won't go through all of them, right? It'll take a while. The bottom line is this, God's saying that never has the word of God come about by man's interpretation, by man's being, by man forming it. It's all of God. So now as we get into the book of James, and if you want to go back to James chapter 1, 
We're talking about what God's word can do to radically change your life. Has your life been radically changed as a result of the word of God? So this morning what we're going to do, we're going to examine three radical things the word of God can do in your life. First thing, what is God's will for you? So what we're going to do, we're going to read James 1.18, then we're going to look at another verse for a moment. But James 1.18 says this, Of his, God, Jesus' own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. There's not a single person in here who's trusted Christ that hasn't heard the word of God. You cannot come to Christ unless the word of God cuts you in two. And there you are. And you listen to the word of God and all of a sudden something happened, didn't you? Remember back when you got saved, folks? And you say, Brother Rich, I don't know what it means to be saved. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Well, you stay tuned. We'll come back to you. But if you're here this morning and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, at one point, somebody either told you the word of God, you heard the word of God, you read a gospel tract, you did something that the word of God came in, and the Holy Spirit used that and started to cut away through the sin layers of your soul, and something happened where the Holy Spirit moved within you, and all of a sudden, what happens? I know what happened with me. I went down to the basement of my parents' home when I was a teenager, and I'd heard the gospel, and I went down, and I knelt down by a couch. I didn't know that's what you're supposed to do, but I did it. And I put my head down in a little studio couch they had down there, and I started pouring out my heart. I knew I was unsaved. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I knew to, needed Jesus and God's word, because some lady at a Bible study a couple of weeks early, had told me the gospel. She read the word of God to me. And all of a sudden, it cut me. Folks, have you been there? Do you remember? Do you remember what happened when the word of God all of a sudden started working in your life? And something changed of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, next week, we're going to talk about some Jewish feasts. We're going to talk about what the first fruits means. We're going to skip it for today, but here's the concept. All of the first fruits, in other words, the first part of the barley harvest, the first, first part of the grapes, uh, every single thing that the Jewish people did, the first things were always given to God. And Jesus is saying, listen, you are the first fruits as Christians. You are part of me. You're what's dedicated to me. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. It's on the screen for you. Chapter 2, verse 14. God's will is that you are moved by the word of God. Now, here's a problem. It's a big problem. Sometimes people say, you know, I opened up the word of God. It just doesn't mean anything to me. I, I, I've gone through it and, and there's nothing there before you're saved. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Catch this. But the natural man, you know what the natural man is? It's the person who has not been, using Christian terms, born again yet. They haven't trusted Christ as their personal savior yet. They are natural. They're carnal. They're still in themselves the word of god hasn't had the power to cut them apart yet so to speak all right but the natural man or the unsaved person does not receive the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness to him so the unsaved person before they get saved before the holy spirit moves them through the gospel they may open up the uh, uh, the bible i remember going to church for years and years and years in, uh, in uh, churches where i know the pastor wasn't saved that he didn't believe in the gospel i didn't know that didn't make i just went to church because it was the right thing to do when i was a kid my mom and dad said go and i went and i'd read the word of god and i'd go through it and it's like okay when are we playing ball <laughs> right no effect on me why? Because I was a natural man. I was unsaved. I didn't know Jesus Christ yet. And, and the Bible makes it clear. If you're natural, if you've never trusted Jesus, the word of God, whatever. Yeah, okay, let's read the newspaper. I get more out of that. And that's what God's saying. Listen, the Holy Spirit can't really work in your heart. The word of God can't really tear you apart until you've trusted Christ. You've got to get past base one. Base one is receiving the gospel. Then the word of God can do marvelous, marvelous things. Have you ever wondered when you're, maybe when you're witnessing to somebody, you're sharing the gospel, and, and, and you're really not there yet, but you're kind of doing some peripheral talk, and, and the person is just like, I mean, it's just going like, whatever, whatever, whatever. Makes no sense. Could care less. You know why? They're a natural person. They haven't been born again yet. They haven't trusted Jesus yet. And that's exactly what the verse is saying. But here's where we're trying to get to. 
of his own will he, br he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his, correct of his creatures. So the unfortunate thing is there are people that are rejecting God's word. Do you know why they're rejecting God's word? Because they've rejected Christ. When you receive Christ, all of a sudden that radical regeneration, that radical, any of you have water softeners? Okay, a lot of you. I live on a well which blew up the night before the prayer meeting start. And I'm like, seriously? I'm going to be in the tent meeting for 24 hours, starts at noon. Guess when the well guy could come over? And we have to have water. Guess when he could come over? Noon on Friday. My son was home before he went to work. So he was there. He let the well guys in. They started uh, working on the new pump that had to be put in. And I'm like, seriously, he had to go to work. I had to run home for a couple of hours. So I missed a few of you that were there in the early afternoon on Friday. And I'm like, Lord, I know why this is happening. And I knew exactly why it happened. That well could blow it up any other day. It's been in there for 25 years, and it had to pick the day before the tent of meeting. You don't think Satan wants to shut stuff down, folks? You say, well, you might be spiritualizing that a bit. I might be. But folks, I'll guarantee you, every single time something is going to happen for God, you're going to get attacked. It's going to happen. Last week, we had a problem with uh, technical issues, right? It happens. Why? Because Satan doesn't want this to move forward. He doesn't. James chapter 1 says, uh, uh, verse 18 says, By his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. How about regeneration by God's word? Let's go to uh, Ephesians. It's on the screen. And uh, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were what? dead, dead in trespass, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Have you been saved, my dear friend? Those watching on live stream right now, have you been saved? Have you trusted Christ? Has the word of God moved in you and changed your life? Have you become a new creature in Jesus Christ? Folks, if you have, oh, how, how happy we ought to be, right? You know why folks I'm not kidding, folks, uh, and it was perfect. God kept slowly bringing in people into that tent of meeting for 24 hours. A great number of you were there. Again, we didn't take attendance. I didn't care who was there. I just said, if you can come, you come. And folks, they just kept coming. A couple here, a couple there, a couple there. At midnight, we packed out the tent. We had about uh, 13, 14 people in the tent. That's packed out. <laughs> But they stayed, and about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, people uh, slowly started to go away and then had a small break of about a half an hour, and then they started coming again in the morning, and people came and they prayed, and God moved in their hearts, and, and folks, it was wonderful. Why? Because we said, listen, we, need, we not only need God's word. Folks in there, I, I'm convinced, uh, uh, and I trust, uh, most if not all that came were saved. They trusted Christ, and their hearts were moved, and, and now they went to the next level, not just hearing the word of God, but talking to God. And the prayers came forth, folks, for you, and you, and you, and you, and this church, and the entire community. Why? Because you care. Do you know how that moved me? I almost lost it. <laughs> you know how that moved me to see folks come and pray and pray and pray and give their hearts and say, Lord, do something here at Union Grove Baptist Church like never been done before. Folks, and we're going to keep at it. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep moving forward. I'm charged up like never before. Somebody said, Ma, I, I don't even catch what I'm doing. I don't. I had one of the, the deacons say the other night when we were praying, and, and, and he was praying, and he, and he said, you know, uh, help us to uh, keep up with Brother Rich with all the changes he's making. <laughs> I'm like, really? We're, we're making changes? I just do what I always do. And, and it moved me, though, and it's like, okay. It, it's been, and by the way, I listen to those prayers because my heart needs to be moved the same. And, and I said, Lord, I hope I'm not doing things too fast here. I said, I, didn't, I don't think I'm just moving at slow pace right now. Ooh, don't get scared. <laughs> Why? There's 4,900 and some people that live in Union Grove, Wisconsin, folks. Maybe there's 100 people here today. 
Maybe a few hundred of those 4,900 people in Union Grove go to another Bible-believing church. But I'm going to guess beyond a shadow of a doubt that out of those 4,900 people, that probably 4,000 people in this community are lost on their way to a horrible place called hell, a lake of fire. And I'm like, God, please help us reach these people. I'm so thankful for the folks that are here. And I want you to grow spiritually, and I want you to grow closer to God. But folks, we've got to have a compassion for our community. Not only are there 4,900 people around our community in Union Grove, but there's many, many different little communities scattered throughout here with hundreds and hundreds of people. I drive by the farm fields every single day to come to Union Grove Baptist. And I look at those farm homes. My wife lived on a Montana farm out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody would ever come to her little farm and tell them about Christ. And I think about farmers, those that are out there. Nobody seems to care about them. They're all alone and they have the same burdens and cares that me and you do if you live in the city. Do we care? Have we been radically regenerated to the point where I got to tell somebody what's happened to me? Wow, I get charged up. So what does the Word of God do? It says, even when we were dead in trespasses, what happened? You were dead in your trespasses, folks. You were dead in your sin is what it's simply saying. And all of a sudden, the Word of God came into you, the Holy Spirit moved in your life, and you received a radical regeneration. Amen? Come on. <laughs> Radically regenerated for the Lord Jesus. Let's move on. You ready for the tough part? Here comes. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Folks, here's where the rubber's got to meet the road right now. What's the practical side of this? Cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity. You say, what do you mean by cultural Christianity? What I'm saying is, is that in the United States of America, even though the last presidential administration said we're in a post-Christian era, and to some degree he's right, but folks, this is not a post-Christian era at Union Grove Baptist Church. And my biggest fear is that we have individuals in this church, I have no idea who they would be, so don't think I'm pointing at anybody. I'm not pointing at anybody. You say the right things. You look good when you come to church. You know how to, you know how to say the right things at home. You, you know the culture of being a Christian. You know everything about it. You know the lingo. You know how to say born again, and you know what it means. You know how to say the word I'm saved, and, and you know what that means. You know how to talk about regeneration. You may know theology. You may know the word of God backwards, forwards, and upside down, but it's cultural. You say, what do you mean? What I'm saying is this, it's a religion. It's not a conversion. And that, again, for a pastor's heart, that's the worst thing in the possible world that could happen is that you, you've been cultural in everything. You grew up from, I, 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 and I've heard this many times over the years, where a young person, uh, teenager, even some adults, and, they'll, and I'll ask them, if you died, are you sure you go to heaven? And here's the response. Well, I grew up in a Christian home. I've always known Jesus. And I said, really? Are you sure you've really known Jesus, or have you known about Jesus? Have you known all the lingo? Have you known all the things? But have you ever truly been converted? Was there truly ever a time when God reached down into your heart, moved you in a fantastic way, and you gave your life to Christ? I've always known him. No, you haven't. You can't be born a Christian. I like to say if... Uh, you put somebody in a garage and don't make them a car, <laughs> right? You don't put someone in the church and make them a Christian just because they walk in the doors. Have you ever been born again? Have you ever trusted Christ? Have you ever truly, truly received Jesus? You say, Brother Rich, you talk a lot about evangelism in, in your messages. I do. Because... I teach the Word, and you come back at 11 o'clock when we tape our 6 p.m. service, I'll give you more heavy-duty theology than you want, okay? 
But on Sunday morning, I'm always concerned that folks aren't saved, that people come in, that, that you might be here for a long time. And folks, what the worst thing a pastor can do is not know the sheep. And your sheep that come to this church, I don't mean that in a bad way, it's a biblical term. And you better know the sheep, and you better make sure the sheep are protected. And folks, the pastor's job, one of his jobs, many jobs, is to make sure his sheep know the Savior. The chief shepherd, not this shepherd. I want you to know me too, but I want to make sure you know the chief shepherd. Are you thinking you're saved because of your religion? Because you've been to church? Because you've heard the lingo? And that's exactly what God says can't happen. There's got to be a radical change in your life. Something has to happen at some point in your life where Jesus Christ all of a sudden becomes meaningful to you. The Holy Spirit touches you and bam, it changes you in a radical way. Now, you might have gotten saved and, and, and you say, well, my, my change was slow. And that can happen. Sometimes people get saved and it takes some time. But folks, when you truly are immersed in the word of God and it becomes part of your life, you're going to see some radical changes. Some of you think I'm crazy radical. <laughs> no laughs. Well, that's good. I am a radical. I'm radical for the Lord. And if I'm not radical enough, you tell me. I'll get pumped up. I'll spend more time in the Word. We'll open up that 24-hour tent. Now, let's make it 10 hours next time. <laughs> that 24 is a killer. But it was a good killer. Let's move on. James chapter 1, the renovating work of the Word of God. James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear. Now, catch the context. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the Word of God. Now, there's a very practical thing we're going to bring into this passage, but remember the context here is talking about God's Word. So what is he saying? He's saying, so then, my beloved brethren, Christian, let every person, every man, every woman be what? Swift to hear. What is he talking about? In context, you may say, well, what is the slow to speak, slow to wrath? That must mean we need to be careful how we talk to each other. That's the practical side, but that's not the context here. What God is saying in this passage is, let every person be swift to hear the word of God. That's contextually accurate. Swift to hear the word. Folks, you know why you're here this morning? How many folks get up 7, 8 o'clock in the morning to be here for a 9 o'clock service? Right? You're, you're here because you want to be swift to hear. You're up early. You're here. Swift to hear the Word of God. How about seven days a week? Does this puppy ever come off the shelf Monday through Friday or through Saturday? Ah. And folks, if it doesn't, you know what? It's going to be a tough life for you. Even if you're born again, even if you're saved, you trusted Christ, this word has to get into our life every single day. You say, well, you're a preacher. You need to study it. I'm not a preacher. I don't need to study it. Wrong. 2 Timothy 2.15, every single person, every person that's trusted Christ, study, be swift to hear the word of God. So that my beloved brethren, let every man be what? Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Listen attentively to God's word. And folks, you're in here for an hour, hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning. Some of you go to Sunday school. Some of you go to Wednesday night. Some of you are involved in other ministries. It's not enough. How many of you had parents? <laughs> I think it's all of us, right? Every single one of us in this room have had parents. When you're growing up, when you're, up, when especially, and we've got some uh, brand new cute little babies in the church. You got some cute little young folks. You got some cute little toddlers, and you got some cute little young uh, 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 adults in here. Very young adults, like 10 and under, 12 and under. <laughs> what would happen if... Uh, your six-year-old said, I'm, I'm tired of listening to mom and dad. I'm done. I'm doing it on my own. <laughs> right? How would they fare? Well, I'm eight years old. I know all there is to know about life. I'm going out, getting a job. I'm leaving home. 
I'm 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old. I don't need mom and dad anymore. I know all there is to know when you walk out. What's going to happen? I've been saved a year. I read the Bible once. I'm good. Nope. I, I, I got saved 15 years ago. I know all there is to know about the Word of God. Folks, I've been saved for more years than I'm going to tell you. <laughs> And I'm learning new things in this word every day. Folks, I'm not, I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to pat my back here. But folks, I've been in Bible schools and seminaries since 18 years old. I just finished my second doctorate a few weeks ago. And I'm still learning things. You say, uh, uh, are you that dumb? You got to keep going back and get more schooling? Yeah, I am. I am. You, 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 know, you know why? Because... When people tell me, I know everything there is. I, I, I had a young pastor. I, I got to tell this. He's an associate pastor at another church. And, and he came in one day, and we're having a, a, a staff meeting. And he says, you know, I, I think I've learned everything there is to know in the Bible. I know it all. And there's nothing new that you folks can teach me. I mean, straight up, he said that. <laughs> I was like, he must be telling a joke. It's serious. You see, if you've got people in Christian leadership that think they've learned the whole book and know everything that's in it, they haven't started learning it yet. You know what I'm saying? Can we talk? You get what I'm saying? I, I mean, the word of God, listen attentively. Lean on God's word. Lean on it. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. What's God say? The more you lean on his word, the more it will radically change you. Folks, do you read the word of God? You're like, mm, I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. I don't have time. I don't either. But I make time. I make time. Do you make time to read God's word? Do you ever make time uh, to get into his word, to let it move you, to let it change you? Folks, if you don't, you're missing out. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Let's look at this for a moment. Listen before reacting. This is practical. Now, we're, taking, we're going a little bit out of the contextual here. What is he saying? Listen before reacting. Be swift to hear. Listen to the word of God. Let it move in your heart. Let it move you. And then what does he say? Listen. Let's go to it. Let every man be what? Swift to hear. Let's go to a real practical side for a moment. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Folks, I'm almost out of time already, so we're going to go quick through this. Do you know how many people mess up their lives because of not listening and being swift to hear? And all of a sudden, we're swift to talk. And all of a sudden, we got a problem. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. Do not correct a scoffer, one who mocks, shows contempt, lest he hates you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Do not correct a scoffer. Do you know what a scoffer is? It's the person who mocks. It's the person who shows contempt. And, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, you're, you're upset with something, and, and you want to say something. And instead of listening, you react. Boom. Fireworks go off. What happens, right? What happens when you get in a fuss at home? Somebody reacted. Do you know how many times I haven't listened to everything that somebody says in my own home and I start to react before I even listen to the end? And if I would have probably listened, I probably wouldn't have been fussing right now because they probably were on the right page and I wasn't. You ever been there? Come on, admit it. <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> Do not correct the scoffer lest he hate you. The person who never admits error, the person who refuses to humble themselves, even if they are technically right. Do you know how many times, folks, over the years, and I worked in, excuse me, politics for about 15 years, as well as pastoring, as well as preaching and traveling and having itinerant ministry. But you know, I hate that there's politics 
I really do. Because you know what politics is? It's trying to figure out how to make people that don't believe what you do, how to get along with them. And folks, that's all politics is. It's trying to convince people who don't believe what you believe. And it gets real sticky. Do you know how many times I've had to eat crow in my life, even when I was right, and I knew I was right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. And I'm, and I'm serious, I'm, I'm sincere. But you know what? If I'd have kept my mouth shut in the first place and listened, you been there? The person is more concerned about proving they are right than building a relationship. Folks, if me and you disagree on something, unless it's something that really is important biblically or whatever, I'm good. You know how much it upsets me? Not a whole lot. Do you know that some of you don't exactly believe everything that I may believe? You know some of you live maybe a little different lifestyles than I live? Do you know some of you like to do some things that I could care less about doing? <laughs> we're different. I like what one pastor once said. He said, you know, if all of us were the same, one of us is not needed. One of us is, we are different. Do you know that all the giftedness that's in this room right now, you do stuff that I can't do. God has called you to Union Grove Baptist Church because you can do wonderful things that this guy can't do. I get the, like I say, I get the good job. I get to stand up here and preach the word. I love it. But I'll tell you what, don't put me in the nursery. <laughs> Every time we had a, my, uh, two of my three children are here, one lives out in Columbus. And every time those new little babies were born, what did I do? I don't want to touch it. I'll break it. <laughs> we'd bundle them up in the little baskets and the little car seats, and we'd put on their cute little clothes, and I'd drive like uh, I'm 95 years old. And I'm like, please, Lord, no traffic as I take my babies home. By the way, we need nursery workers. Just throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> You know why? Because some of you, you pick up those little babies, you know how to hold them, and you love them, and you see them, and you, you just, it just moves you. I know they, babies make movements, and therefore I'm not interested. <laughs> but you are. And God bless those who are. Folks, that's part of what we need. Well, we've got to move on. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Folks, you know what splits churches? Harsh words. You know what makes people run away? Harsh words. You know what breaks hearts and lives? Harsh words. Folks, the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, is a lie. Folks, people get hurt more by what we say than if you punched them in the face. People's lives have been destroyed by what people say. People leave churches because of something a person said. Marriages are ruined and divided because of something someone said. Children are defrauded and, and hate their moms and dads because of something that they heard them say. You know, where, you know where we're going here, folks, how important it is to temper the speech. And God says, listen, don't be a wrathful person. It'll be swift to hear, slow to speak. Slow to wrath. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Folks, you know, if you could get a hold of that, that's the word of God. If you can get a hold of that one word, you will have a radical transformation in your life. Radical. You'll stop fighting, you'll stop fussing, you'll stop caring about, I'm right. It doesn't matter if we're right. I want to be right about the gospel. I want to be right about God's principles. But everything else is peripheral. Doesn't matter. I don't like the toilet seat left up in my house. So I put it down. But you know what? If somebody leaves it up, it's okay. And then I'll turn it down. <laughs> you see silly little things like that, and it do you know how much fussing goes on in homes over a toilet seat? <laughs> it's over or under on the paper. Well, for a couple of months we didn't have any paper to put up or down, so we were all good. <laughs> But you see, that's exactly it. Can we laugh at these things? Can we say, how silly? 
And boy, we get bent out of shape. Someone in my family squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. Oh. <laughs> Back to front. Back. <laughs> I have to fix it every time. <laughs> Folks, I love you. I care about you. And if you catch my drift here, what is the message about? It's about, folks, it is about being in the Word. It is about knowing the Lord Jesus. Finally, says, receive with meekness the implanted Word. What does the implanted Word mean here? It means that the, you take the Word of God and you sow it into a person's heart, just like you take seed and drop it on the ground. And then as that seed is put in the ground, it begins to germinate. And all of a sudden you watch as it springs up and it produces fruit. And that's what God is saying about the Word of God. Receive with meekness. Read this book in a humble manner. Let it tear you apart and be happy with it, is what he's saying. Let it grow in you. Let it spring up. Let it produce its spiritual fruit, which is what? It's able to save your souls. Now we're closing. We started out the message, have you been radically changed by the word of God? Has it moved within you? Have you been changed? Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal savior? Have you been and have you received the implanted word? Has it come within you? Has it germinated? Has it been springing up? Are you excited about what God's doing in your life? You say, man, I, you do you know how hard it was to come to church today? Do you know I really could care less about being here this very moment? Do you know that somebody almost forced me to come today? And you're not excited. I don't know who it is, but I'm sure there's somebody like that here. It was a struggle to walk in the building this morning. You know why? <laughs> because that word of God wasn't working in you yet today. And God says, listen, first of all, have you ever trusted Christ? You know the gospel. I know folks in this room know it. That's why those of you that know it, I always ask you to pray during this little time that when we share the gospel. There's folks watching right now. There may be someone in this room. And if you died right now, you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. And folks, that's the most important thing. That's what the Word of God is there to do to change our lives. Have you received the implanted Word, the Word of God? You say, what do you mean? Number one, the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, the Bible tells us that because we sinned, if we got what we deserved, every single one of us would spend eternity in hell. Revelation 21.8. But Jesus Christ, God's Son, came down from heaven, went to a cross, died on that cross. Why did God die on the cross? Because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. He died for you. He suffered as no man ever suffered when he took all the sins of the world upon his back. And God asks you to do one thing. Have you ever received the free gift of eternal life through trusting in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus? Have you ever trusted him? Folks, if you're here this morning and you've been a cultural Christian, it's time to get saved. It's time to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your deep love for us. And Father, right now is a very important time, and we went a little over again. But Father, this is so important. There may be someone in this auditorium right now, could be a young person, could be an adult, could be a teenager, could be a senior citizen, might have been going here all their life, and they don't know you as Savior. Father, I pray you touch their heart. I pray you'd allow the Holy Spirit to work on them right now. If you're never trusted Christ, let's get that accomplished this very moment. It's not cultural Christianity. It's a conversion. It's receiving the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Are you ready to give up your sin life and take over and say, Jesus, I want you 100% as the master of my life? Are you ready? If you are, would you say this little prayer with me? The prayer is not what saves you, but we're going to tell Jesus what you're doing in your heart right now. Are you ready? Would you pray with me? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know because I've sinned, I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I'm thankful that Jesus, your son, came down from heaven, died on the cross, was buried, and three days later rose again. I believe that with all my heart. And I'm right now, I'm accepting that free gift, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm taking that verse, I'm taking that promise, 
And I'm receiving Jesus this very moment. Father, seal those decisions. Christian, if you're here this morning, listening, have you been reading that word of God every single day? You say, I'm so busy, I don't have time. You don't know my schedule. I know I don't. But God needs to talk to you through his word. Would you right there where you're seated, would you ask God to help you get in his word? Folks, it's the only thing that can change your life on a daily basis. Father, seal decisions. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and all God's people said. Let's stand together uh, as we close the service today. We're going to close with uh, just one verse of this song, Softly and Tenderly. It is found on 325 in the hymn book. Just verse number one is a way of closing today. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner come home a couple of things as we're being dismissed if you did pray today and you did make a decision for Christ the very best thing you can do next is to tell someone else about it I'd encourage you to talk to Pastor Rich about that or someone else that you know as a believer that you trust and then also, if you came prepared to give uh, in the offering today, we did not pass the plates. We'll, we'll get back to that eventually. Uh, but the, plate, the offering plates are in the back there. Some ushers are back there holding them. So if you did come ready to give this morning and want to do that, plates are back there. Again, guests this morning, please feel no obligation to participate. Otherwise, thank you all so much for being here. And have a great Lord's Day. And we are dismissed. Thank you.